Oh. <laughs> well, good evening and welcome. Uh, as you can see, the star of the show tonight is uh, Jeff's beer keg, uh, <laughs> for some reason, uh, which was a bit unexpected. So, welcome. Right. It's uh, right, uh, <laughs> 74 of the Brew Gooders uh, League of uh, Beer and Comics. So, um, a bit of a different um, session tonight. Um, not the usual kind of well, although we will be talking beer a bit, we will be talking comics a bit, but we've got several guests in tonight. So uh, joining us tonight, uh, special guest Steve McManus, former 2008 AD editor. We've also got Dan Cornwell, uh, who who also worked for 2008 AD, um, we'll mention that later on, but also well known for Rock of the Reds and Rock of God. Um, and we've got Binksy back with us again after uh, last time's uh, um furniture removal thing that he did uh, I don't know why we invited him back but he's back tonight to tell us about <laughs> the comic book that uh, that both Dan and Steve are involved with so without much further ado I think we need to get them in out of the green room <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, who would you like to bring in let's bring in Steve first we'll bring in Steve hi everyone oh, hey. cool. Awesome. Sorry, there we go. I wanted to put Steve in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, put me in the middle. How are well, you? Steve, it's awesome to have you here. Um, obviously, we're going to be talking about um, your new comic book, new old comic book, uh, Blazer, which is coming out a little bit later um, this year um, and is currently on Kickstarter. Um, so we thought we'd love to have you on and tell us a wee bit about how that all came about. Um, and obviously, we've got to start by talking about this novel of yours, The Sheer Glam Conspiracy. So um, this came out, what, 2019, I think it was. Um, and I have to say, when I bought bought this, I thought I was going to get a kind of true life um, expose of the comics industry. <laughs> and I have to say, if even 10% of this is true, I'm glad I wasn't part of it back then. <laughs> <laughs> So can you tell us a little bit about Hugh Glam Conspiracy? Hi, good evening, everyone. Yeah, sure. I'm going to just preface this by saying I'm going to play the old Git card tonight because I'm going to be 68 in, in February. So I want everyone to realise that if I stumble my words, it's because I'm an old Git and not that my batteries run down as a drone. <laughs> <would. laughs> hey, so, yeah. you, 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 I, I stumble my words almost minutely on this podcast so no one's going to be judging you <laughs> oh thank you yeah because i'll be brilliant anyway so yeah here she is the shake man that's gloria shake man and her um her cult really her, her, her people that she has um inveigled to um follow the words of um um i have to say it colin a scottish guy <laughs> whose whose <laughs> desire is to, to dream his dream is to retire to the Highlands with a bunch of a bevy of looking girls who and listen to his favourite music, which is Wagner. And um, that's his dream. And the whole book follows his kind of <laughs> his attempts to do that. Um, uh, at the same time, there's a company across the road from his. His company is called Tartan Editions. And there's a company across the road this is all set in 1973 so you can see where i'm going with this um, called good enough publications and they are the rivals and um they are trying to launch a new title to um kind of smash tartan editions out of the out of the um the court and this is the dynamic and we we witness everything through the eyes of the young irish girl from uh, Arlen Sinead, who, who is not quite sure what's going on. And um, through her eyes, we meet a cast of characters who are larger than life. And I can tell you, as Colin says, most of the characters I worked with were larger than life. And a lot of what I write about in The Shape Man Conspiracy uh, <laughs> has a resonance in the past. But um, uh, I'm happy to say, as far as I know, there were no murders during my time at Fleetway. <laughs> <laughs> so at, at the end of uh, Sheer Glam Conspiracy, I'm not no spoilers. I mean, at the end of the physical book, um, there's a whole bunch of uh, comic scripts. 
um, because uh, obviously the, the part of the story is that this new comic called Blaze is going to be be launched, um, and then there's a bunch of the the, the actual stories. Um, appear as comic script right at the end with a little note to, calling out to artists that if they want to practice their, their artwork, they can pick up these scripts and, and give it a go. Um, but of course, that all changed quite recently, a few months ago, uh, kind of last summer, I guess it was, when you actually got a bit of a call from somebody saying, you know, why don't we just make this into a comic? That's right, uh, Colin. Uh, I got the uh, I got the phone call. Oh God! <laughs> Have I won the pools? No. Have I won the premium bonds? No. Hi, it's Banksy here, mate. Oh, I thought we might have a comic. <laughs> I said who? No, seriously. I got this lovely phone call from Ben Cullis, who uh, told me all about himself and his editorial team and how they were going to launch a comic called the. 77 as a kind of nostalgic feedback to the comics we they bought in their youth or perhaps i worked on and um ben initially said why can't we put one episode in each episode of the 77 and after doing that for two years he suddenly rang back and said look we've got to make a whole comic out of this just as you had planned it in in the shared man conspiracy so that's how it all came out. And it was Ben who sourced all the artists, including the lovely Dan Cornwall, who um, is a brilliant artist. And um, I, I love his work. And uh, I was very brave of him to <laughs> draw one of my scripts. Um, and the Kickstarter, um, I think as Ben will tell you, in his own green room bit, has gone rather well. Okay, uh, so should we bring in Ben at this point, and, and perhaps Dan as well? Um, yeah. And get get their perspective on working. Um, Good evening, gentlemen. Hello, Good evening, Dave. Hello. Hello, Good Dan. Day, How are you doing? Hello, Steve. All Hello, good, all good. Hello, Hello, all good, all good. Welcome, Ben and Dan. So, um, Ben, we're going to start off speaking to you because we've, we've been chatting with Steve there about Sheer Glam Conspiracy and kind of the storyline there, and then obviously it ends up with the, the scripts from the fictional Blaze comic. Um, and that's kind of where you come in sometime, maybe, a, I don't know, a year ago with the 77 comic and your plans for uh, global domination. So, uh, tell us <laughs> about that, Yeah, so that's right. I was, uh, as you do, find yourself at 30,000 feet on a, on a jumbo jet going off on your honeymoon to, uh, to, to the West Indies. Um, and I had with me, yeah, my my, my copy of, of Sheer Glam Conspiracy, which I got from Steve. And honestly, I, I just laughed and laughed and laughed as I was reading it. Yeah, I promise it wasn't all the, the copious amounts of um, Appleton's rum I was drinking on the way over. But <laughs> honestly, I just loved it. And um, Kirsty kept turning around to me and saying, what's this, what's that? And I just kept on saying, it's just these stories are getting dafter and dafter. And I don't mean the scripts in the back of the book. I actually meant the novel itself. It is just so funny. Steve's writing just makes me laugh and laugh. So um, obviously at that point, I've got to say the 77 was just a background kind of, you know, in the background working along. And with the, the first strip we got together was um, the Tinkling Triangles. Um, what are they, sonorous superstars? Is that how you, uh, how you describe them, Steve? <laughs> yes. Ably, yes, yes, I mean yeah. more than ably, brilliantly um, put together the the, the 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 artwork by Brendan Wright, who's a lovely, lovely guy, um, and he put so many Easter eggs in the story as well. There's Thanos's glove, the the what is it, the Eternicus gauntlet, or whatever the heck that thing is, at the Space Center. He's done a great first page, which looks very sort of Dan Darish, you know. Um, he put in all sorts of little little funny. There's Mac written on the side of a spaceship and a 77. And anyway, so that went into number one. Um, and then we got Charlie Gillespie, who's quite well known to um, 2000 D readers. And he's done um, covers for Comic Scene. He did an interesting story um, called The Collector, which is, again, from um, the original um, series of scripts in the back. And obviously by this time we were thinking, well, we'll just carry on doing this. And but then kind of had the light bulb moment of thinking, well, it deserves to be its comic. But then Steve came back with the bad news. He said, we can't call it Blaze. <laughs> I'm like, what do you mean you can't call it Blaze? And apparently 
it's um, already in the DC universe or Marvel universe or something. So um, it's ever so slightly changed its name to Blazer, which I think is just fine, absolutely fine. And um, we've had fun over the last six months, really. And the gentleman to my to my to my left is our latest recruit. And I've got to ask, so sorry about this, gentleman. Dan, how's the artwork coming on, mate? <laughs> It's, it's getting there. It's getting there. It's funny you used to say. I was, I was, I was. I'm working on it this week, um, and I was about to start a fresh page uh, this morning, this afternoon, um, and um, I got a phone call from the estate agent because we're in the process of selling our home, and they oh, um, they said, "Oh, we're, we're, is it okay if we can bring someone round at four in a, like, a couple of hours. And I was like, really? I'm in the middle of work, but you can't turn these things down, can you? Because you're going to get a house sale. You're going to get the house sale. Um, but yeah, it's going really well. Although I did I did miss a panel out because Steve's scripts are done in the f format that I'm not used to. They're, they're, it's not page one and then panel one. It's just, it's just 24, 25 different panels, isn't it? And because yeah. I'd done the first page as a splash, it's threw out all of my prelims. So I'm sitting there going, but where does that? So I to, uh, yesterday I was working on all that again, trying to rearrange all the panels and that. But yeah, it's going good. It's going good. I like, I like the reference in all the military equipment and things like that. That's, uh, that's enjoyable. And drawing all of that old school stuff and drawing jungle warfare, you know, perfect, isn't it? So, so should we drop the point here that actually, there is, he's up there. Colin, Colin is doing a strip as well. You're being very self-effacing, Colin. And, and, and um, you know, I've, I've already seen your stuff and I think it's fantastic. So only you and Dan really can talk to each other about working on Steve's work because you've had to um, translate the scripts and stuff. So why don't you chat amongst yourselves? And I mean, I don't know. How are you finding this experience of working on such a legend's um, scripts? Well, what's it been like, you know? Dan, I had the same, I had the same issue where, um, yeah, the script is just a whole bunch of panels, and I was like, "How is this like twenty four panels on a page? Or how is this? Like, <laughs> <laughs> how, how small am I to draw these panels?" Yeah. 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 I think that that would be a page turn there, but I'm not sure. And then, oh God, how am I going to do that? And there were one or two bits that have kind of. Yeah, it's quite difficult because I, I, I did what I did I, I did just one page, and when there was a change of scene, I was like, when there's, when there's a, a, a drastic change of scene, if you like, um, I like that to be the first panel on a new page, and generally that's the way. But because I've done this splash page, and it's all out of sync a bit, this change of scenes like a middle panel of a page now, and I'm hoping it will work. It's not. It's not. You know, it's not a different city or something, different part of the jungle. Um, but I'm hoping it works. But it's not too late, not too late to sack the artist. We can get a new one. If he's not up there, <laughs> but am, I, am I right in saying this is how it used to be done? This is how scripting used to be? Yes, absolutely. And don't blame me. I, I learned my trade from um, Tom Tony, Scott Goodall, Angus Allen. I know Pat Mills and John Wagner and Jerry McGay. None of them ever said which page you were meant to be on. <laughs> it was just <laughs> piece of pictures. Sort it out, dude. <laughs> well, tell me, Dan. Yeah, don't, yeah. Don't, well, say it's, it's... Did, don't say that John did Rock of the Reds in the same way, though, right? No, no, no. I did actually email John <laughs> saying I'm working on the Blazer, this script from Blazer, and, and obviously the legendary Steve McManus. And I said to him, I go, I've got the script. And I go, there's no bloody page numbers. And he goes, no, 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 that's old school. That's how we used to do it. I was like, oh, okay, fair enough. He goes, it's down to you to sort all that out. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. That's what you're paid to do. Welcome to episode 74 of the Brigaders, where we, where we critique our, the way that our heroes write their comic scripts. Um... <laughs> Well, I'm going, to, I'm going to ask Dan to retell this hilarious story because he did it. We had a show a few nights ago on the start of the Kickstarter. It was funny then and it will be funny now. So come on, Dan. What was your reaction when your printer started printing out all the pages that you thought you were going to be doing? for? Um, the script? Well, yeah, it's, uh, you sent me the file for the script. So um, I just send that wirelessly to the printer to print out. And then, then I went and made a cup of tea and... Um, when I came back into the studio, 
the printer was still printing. It's just twenty odd pages so far, and I was like, "What the?" So it it stopped, and I picked up this wad, and um, it, it must be about thirty odd pages of script. So I sent you. A, did I, mess, I messaged you, didn't I? And I said, "Have I agreed to do all of this? Is this what I've agreed to?" And he was like, "No, no, no. You printed out the entire script for the for the whole book." I was like, "Oh, thank God for that. I thought because I haven't got time." <laughs> <laughs> now, Dan, Dan, were you given a choice of which which script to go for? Um, I think Ben um, gave me uh, a, a, a few. You know, um, he said, "Oh, we've got this, we've got that, and we've got that." But as soon as I heard the Second World War one, um, that's the one I wanted to do because uh, you know I, I, I do in I've not done one before. I think I did a very brief. Um, bit of second world war comic art in a judge dread story where they go to a hotel and um they can reenact reenact re they can play uh, uh <laughs> parts from certain eras through history and there's a part in it where they're playing the second world war so um but I, i've always wanted to get my hands dirty on a, a a good second world war story um preferably ships but it happened to be in the jungle so i'm, I'm happy with that one <laughs> Nice. So, so did you just completely shy away from doing the football story? <laughs> uh, I, don't, I don't think I was asked that, was I? I don't think I was offered the football story. Oh. I think that might have been given to someone else at that point. Um, I think it's Filippo. Already, but I would have. Really I would, I would, I would, I would have already agreed. Yeah, I would yeah. have taken. I would have taken the Second World War one either way. It's, I just, I, you know, I wanted to do something like that. You um, must be quite fed up with football stories, in fairness. <laughs> <laughs> well, Rock of the Reds, because I, uh, I do, I do the illustrations for Roy of the Rovers as well um, in the fiction novels. But Rock of the Reds, there isn't a no, it's, it's half and half, or it's probably a, you know, a third of it is football, whereas the rest of it is um, domestic life, uh, sci-fi, <laughs> you know, and all that. Lot. So, um, but like, was it a bit of busman holiday, Dan? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it would have been. It, it'd be something I'm, I'm used to doing, obviously. But uh, the Second World War—that's the one that you know that, that floated my boat. So that's the one I chose. So when I first met Dan and John, uh, um, Lawgiver—not uh, Law Lawless. Lawgiver or Lawless? Lawless. 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 Yeah. Lawless. Look there. You hadn't had really very long given up the the buses. Had there we go. Steve's wearing a t-shirt. You hadn't yeah. gone uh, and yeah, so up the buses, had you, mate? When was Laurelus? Was that um, two years ago? Two years ago. Right. Yeah, so I gave up the buses in 18. So, uh, right. yeah, so pretty before, a year before. Give or take a year before, yeah. Mm. Um, again, because that was, it was um, something I had to give. I was getting more and more work, and it wasn't just comics. I was getting uh, game, some game designs for that, you know, for, for um, the Judge Dread Cursed Earth role-playing game card game and then computer game company wanted me to do some designs for that and i remember reading somewhere that you know uh, some advice for artists aspiring artists and the thing and the like and um they said never turn down paid work um so something I had to give i'm sitting on the buses the money i was going to get from the artwork wasn't as much as i was earning on the buses at, at that point but i couldn't do both so something I had to give and um it wasn't that hard to turn down the buses to be honest <laughs> now, Dan, since we're talking about buses i had a bit of an idea because uh, steve here um is well known as action man you know and doing crazy stunts to, yeah, yeah. to promote comics and and you know dan you must be about the youngest in the team so i i think you should take that over you know some fire-based stunts maybe involving buses <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant idea. We can say, what's Dan going to do? Daredevil Dan, what's he doing Daredevil this Dan. week? Awesome. Yeah, yeah, I, I started, yeah, I started yeah. smoking, so there you go. That's a bit, that's a bit daring, isn't it? <laughs> I think people should write in right now and, and, and we can read out the most ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I have got life insurance now, so that might help, you know. <laughs> I, I, and by the way, I'm scared of heights, so that, nothing high. So, you know, it's all land-based. I've got yeah. to, I never asked Steve this question. So Steve, when you were doing your, your um, action man stuff, 
Did yeah. you ever have a hand in it, or were they really? Here's an envelope. You're going. You're going down to you know I don't know Bexhill on Sea, and you've got to go and jump in a rickety old canoe and you know fight sharks or something. I mean, is that what they used to say? <laughs> Yes, it was all from readers. They were genuine challenges. Because um, you didn't just, you um, nice. didn't you fire eating in one of them? Of course, I went to Jerry Cottle's circus. Just, uh, yeah, he, he just died <laughs> the other day, actually, Jerry. Um, he did, yeah. Pal, Jerry. Yeah, I went yeah. to his circus on a very cold morning at Shepherd's Bush, <laughs> and um, there I was introduced to uh, El Hakim who taught me how to eat fire and um, walk a tightrope and lie on a bag of nails. And gradually it dawned on me that Al Hakim had a very strong Yorkshire accent. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, well, look one of the main things on the podcast is like, we, 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 me and Colin can actually not do any work because he's, <laughs> he doesn't know the stories. So it's like... <laughs> Have you noticed? Look, look how tidy my room is. I'm not moving any furniture. Oh, it's, yeah. it's very tidy. Yeah, it's right. <laughs> uh, Dan, Dan won't know what we're talking about, but uh... no, not, as my, not as tidy as mine yet. No, yours is super <laughs> tidy. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm Honestly, that, it's not who, like whose helmet is that, Dan? Who did that helmet? That one. That's um, it's dread, obviously. <laughs> it's uh. I can't remember. I got it as a, as a as a birthday present about. Is it Planet Replica? Is it one of theirs? I don't think so. no. It's not a Planet Replica. I want a Planet Replica one, but um, um, John Burdis had one for sale on Facebook just the other day. Quite and, a lot um, of money. Was it four hundred? Yes. And um, I was so tempted, but you know, I, I, I've got to pay the bills. I've got to pay the mortgage. So. Um, I was tempted. I was tempted to offer him some artwork, you know, take some pages off me. But after that last podcast we did the other day, I don't think he'd be that interested. Well, you've got another job now, Dan, um, that, that pays danger money. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. There you go. There you go. Yeah, four hundred quid. But the, the the helmet's sold now, so <laughs> <laughs> we should say, Dan, as well. Congratulations, because. You had your first uh, cover for 2000 AD. Oh, this yeah. Week. yeah, that's yeah, a, that's wow. a, that's a off the bucket list. That one, that is um, nice. awesome. Because yeah. I've, I've I've been working with them for um, three four years, and I've, I think I've been in there about forty or fifty issues of the prog and in the mag and whatnot. And the mm -hmm. amount of time, believe me, I've sent I've sent uh, Tharg, I've sent Matt plenty of um. Uh, 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 pin-ups and things like that and um is this any good for a cover and he goes uh possibly he goes we'll, we'll have it but um and he never put it as a cover and i thought how long is this going to take before he finally agrees to it and this one was just really fortuitous i was just i was testing out paper and um because during the summer the ink wasn't soaking into the paper so i was inking and then it was just smudging i was like i've got to find some new paper to to work on um so it's just a sketch that I got carried away with, and I liked it. And then I thought, well, I'm going to colour it myself because um, most, most, if not all of my works, coloured by other people. And I liked it, so I just sent it to Matt, and he said he loved it, and he'll use it for a cover. It? Which um, I didn't know when, and only only a couple of days ago, I found out that um, it, it's coming in next week's yeah. issue. Yeah. I think. That's, all. That's hey. superb. Uh, back, back Thank to you. Steve. Um, Steve, I'm wondering, um, assuming. Blazer is going to be a massive success. Are we likely to see any of these characters again or any continuations of the stories? Well, actually, um, where have you all gone? Oh, yeah, that, that's that's the cover. Lovely. Yeah, sorry, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm really slow. I'm trying to run around doing all the digital stuff behind the scenes, but yeah. It's um, yeah, nice, yeah. Um, yeah to ask the question, uh, Sorry, Ben has breaking news on that. I think as my publisher, I I, I let him. <laughs> <laughs> we, did, we did confer. Yeah, we have conferred. Um, so it's quite exciting. I think basically we've had so much good reaction. Um, and um, although I've yet to confirm with Dan Cornwall whether he's available to do any more art, <laughs> only twenty pages, Dan. Don't worry about it. Um, <laughs> or Colin, in fact. But if I was to say, I mean, I know actually, well, Colin, you've you've already signed up for um, Derringer and Son to um, appear 
I believe in um, another form anyway. Um, so we, 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 we chips appearing. And yes, yeah, Steve, Steve, Steve's agreeing to pen a series of second parts because they all take, do tend, as a good story should, end on a cliffhanger. And uh, we can't really leave the reader <coughs> wondering forever and ever. It's not like, you know, Dan Dare will return one day. It's famous from 2018, but um, Steve Mack stories will return. So Blazer 2 will be happening. Um, and we're, we're fully um, hopeful that that could be this year. Um, and the exciting thing is, is although obviously, as, as, as you mentioned, and it's in let's show the book again as a publisher, I obviously, as a rep, because I should be showing the book again, um, the, the sheer glam conspiracy. <laughs> Um, succession, which I believe, Steve, you're you're writing as soon as you finish this interview. Are you you're going to be going to your writing desk and writing some more? Yes, yes, absolutely. yes. You're not driver, you really. We'll be coming out at some time, um, but no, no. The news is that um, following the 77's first annual, which is being worked on at the moment and going to be released this um, late summer and autumn. Um, next year, we're going to be a Blazer annual. So Ooh. we're certainly going to have an annual. We're certainly going to have Blazer 2. Um, so we're blazing a trail, um, or Blazerites. I think you've already coined that, haven't you, Steve? We're I Blazerites. Guess. Is that right? Yeah, people who love the Blazer. Is that so, going to yeah. be hardback? Oh, it's going to... Mate, it's going to have a little. It's going to have a little price tag in the corner, you know, that your mother used to cut off. It's going to have all those things. It's going No, it's going to have puzzles. It's going to have pinups. It's going to have old 70s stories in, in, in single colour. You know those old single colour strips they used to be in the kind of orange or funny green or something. Yeah, yeah. And they'll be kind of test artists, you know. That's artists bring a couple of strips. Everyone's going, to, everyone's going to buy this annual down as well as the 77. But you know the, the, the joy of getting an annual for Christmas. Oh. I, I used to get I think the be no annual, and it just made my day. But Steve, thought, didn't um, you say, sorry, didn't you say, Steve, that the joy was with the publisher in the fact that didn't you say that the in in the yeah go, yeah that is yeah. a brilliant. Hey, no, show us again, Dan. That is a brilliant. I read that with my wife the other night. It is a cracker. It's, it's, it's just it's just Amazing. and as you said, as you said, Steve, we, we used to get these at Christmas. Mm. I yeah. used to get them. I used to get two thousand AD annuals and whatnot. I'm not sure why it stopped. When did it stop? Was it 91 for 2000? They kind of went softback, didn't they? Yeah. Oh, was that it? It's just not this. Getting the hardback annual at Christmas was, was mm. part yeah. of Christmas. Um, oh, yeah. And I still think, you know, um, it's good that the 77 are doing it. And, um, yeah, yeah. Action. 77 Action. are doing it. And the, I mean, oh, then the Blazer one. That would be awesome. But um, oh, yeah. I, yeah. Why I don't know why 2000 AD wouldn't do it because it would. I think they'd make an absolute. Yeah, I think they would make a killing on it. Look at that! Look at that! That is just solid thrill power, isn't it? You know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, everyone always mentioned about Rogue Trooper's hand not being quite right, so I, I say near to that. But Bolland in this, look at that! That's just awesome, isn't it? Yeah. Perfect, isn't it? I forgot how exciting the experience it was until Colin showed up at my door. Um, and, and his father, Christmas of comics role within the Dunfermline community. But Colin showed up with a, the comics comic scene did the um, did the annual thing yeah. last yeah. year, and it's, it's phenomenal. And uh, yeah. there's so much good reading in it as well, because obviously, so uh, it's it's a bumper edition of, of of an anthology with just loads of stories in it. I agree. What's better than at Christmas time? You know, I was a kid. You used to hide in a corner, didn't you? You'd hide in your corner. Read your annuals. If you were kids like a bit of nerd like me and probably Dan and Colin, we'd be drawing, you know, doing a few copying the pictures and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Finding a quiet bit of spot. But I mean, I'm so much looking forward. So um, I think Steve um, Ball, he's already messaged the group tonight. So he's he's doing the <laughs> 77 one. He's been sat, he's been targeted, you know. So given the job of doing the annual, but hats off to the man above us here. Because I believe that the editors of, of, of 2000 AD and all of the freeway annuals used to have to do it in their spare time, on holiday, at the weekends. You know, they had to oh, – I said, go on, Steve. Tell us a little bit about making an annual, mate. When did you do that? Well, oh, God, where was the time? Um, um, you've, got, you've got 1,200 quid to split between you and the art editors. So it was 700 quid each. 
But um, as you say, it all it was all done at home. You couldn't get in the office because there was no time. Um, mm. there, there's a hero in this story for battle, and it was Doug Church. He would help Dave Hunt out superbly. He would do a lot of work for Dave. Um, and for me, my hero was Robin Smith. He did a, a lot of work on the features for the um, early Judge Drag annuals. Um, it was Robin's idea that a quiz should be on a cornflake packet. Whereas I would have just said, well, any other person, well, a quiz is a quiz, you know. Um, it, <laughs> so um, it was bloody hard work. I remember taking home 16 pages of Carlos Escara. <laughs> Kanga artwork and um, kind of like just checking that Carlos and John's ideas were marrying up and it was about 8 o'clock at night and I just thought oh god I hope I don't lose this on the train back to work <laughs> You weren't tempted to colour it in then with some crayons and pencils and stuff to give it a go you know <laughs> Do you, if you stretch, stretch, it didn't stretch to a colourist that money <laughs> and Carlos, no, He coloured it himself, it was smashing it was, it was Yeah his painted I, work I, Yeah. I so Dan what was your first 2000 Daniel? Can you remember what yours first was? Or? Um I think it was about 86, 87. So I only had, and um, I lost, I lost, um, this is a sob story. I lost, we used to live in a flat in, in Hove um, where the, the basement flooded. It was a rented flat in the basement of this, this flat. I didn't know there was a basement underneath our flat. We'd been living there for like five years and I never knew there was a basement underneath. Um, and it flooded. And this plumber came around and um, explained that it, it, it will all need to be pumped out. It was about, two inches of water um and my skin flint landlord said no 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 we'll just let it air dry two inches of water across the whole basement um so <laughs> obviously so, uh, you know science takes effect and it just mold so we had i had all my 2000 ad collection in the uh, uh, uh under stairs cupboard uh prox uh, magazines uh, annuals the works and um they all went moldy and I had to chuck them all out. And we're talking, you know, you know, when you collect 2008, the piles just get higher and higher and higher. <laughs> and then you've got to figure out sorting this out, put them in boxes and that lot. But yeah, the whole lot had to go. Um, you know, 25 years, 20 years of collecting 2018 and all in the bin. And um, oh, like, nice. along with my annuals. I, did, I think I've still got one annual somewhere. That's what I was looking around for. I don't know where it is. Uh, it might be in a loft. But um, yeah, I've got one annual left, I think. And that's 89, 1989 annual. I've got my, my favourite. I've got 81 and I bought it in a, an antique shop in Cullen, which is <laughs> in a, in the, week, <laughs> the week after I bought it, that same antique shop featured on a, the, what's the one where the, the two guys drive around and then they buy, was it antique, antique road trip? trip. <laughs> but the, the, the same antique shop that I bought my 2008 annual was on a, was on antique road trip the next week. And <laughs> <laughs> but didn't did, wasn't the eighty nine annual? Did that was that a Brendan McCarthy cover? I don't know. Because um, what happened was uh, Ed Kano on the front. I I, oh, I, yeah. I was doing the Judge oh, Dredd oh, annuals, and I gave the two thousand ones to Richard Burton to um, edit and stuff. Because uh, for me, my Judge Dredd annual eighty one was kind of like. The, just it, it was perfection um and i didn't want anyone else to do the next one or the next one so which one's that it, my man, it's the color it's all original stuff there's no filler it's the 82 it's one, all brand new i mean is there an 81 one or is this the very first ones no that's the second apologies one. if i've got the wrong one steve bonland is the 81 uh i have a oh. print wrap version of that can you imagine this? Oh, yeah, Steve, sorry. That's the one, yeah. Brown. So, how many were there in total? How... I had that as enormous poster on the wall. Yeah. Brilliant. How many, how many were there in total? What? Was oh, it, did, it, did it start in 77? It didn't, did it? No, Not it, the, the first one was dated 81, but it would have been 80, 1980. I think he was the one I've got, I think. Um, he is. Oh. I'm gonna have to get. So I think I have to. I'm gonna have to troll through um, eBay and get the collection. I think. 
Mm. You must but this is it. One. They're collectible, yeah. aren't they? And people love family. them, and we have such strong connections to them. I mean, mm. I can't see why. I, I, I can't work out. It's like those adverts on telly for why have people haven't put coffee in bags. You know that funny advert at the moment? Why people dropped comic um, annuals. Oh, no. so, 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 so hats off to Tony Foster from Comic Scene for actually yeah. doing this a couple of years ago. He did his first Comic Scene annual then, which I only got as a digital. And that's where I met Drew Maher or saw Drew Maher's work and saw other people's. Um, so you know, I'm just saying we're just we're just clambering aboard, really, because we we we, we realise from our our fans and, and 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 you know supporters that they would they would go with it. Look at that! You see, look at this quality stuff. It's just fabulous. So the point oh, is, God. is that we've just got a lot of pages to fill, um, Steve Mac. So um, you know, we've got a lot of writing. <laughs> to do, <haven't> we? <laughs> Can I go off piece? Oh, um, Colin has agreed to draw the next Derringer and Son. And I said to him, I want to set it in San Francisco. And he said, oh, man, yeah. I love San Francisco. So we're going to have a lot of fun with um, basically Steve McQueen cars going like this. <laughs> oh, for <laughs> sure. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going to watch all the reruns of Streets of San Francisco, which is kind of from that era. Yeah. That's good, yeah, Colin, exactly, because the yeah. expenses won't run to you going over there. I can tell you that for a start. <laughs> so, oh, hey. He's like, I'm not doing it then. <laughs> when Colin was in San Francisco, you guys great for Colin. When Colin was in San Francisco, he was an extra in one of my favourite cancelled TV programmes of 2008. Oh, what was that? Wow. <laughs> I, I, wasn't, I, wasn't, I wasn't officially an extra. They happened to be filming a TV series called Journeyman. Um, in in the hotel that I was staying in, and and in one of the episodes, I I walked past in the background. <laughs> Fame. <laughs> did, Fame. Did, did, did you did you did did you demand payment for that? <laughs> and was yeah. your name was your name in the credits? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that would be Scott's guy. <laughs> <laughs> Because no, it was Kevin McKinnon was the main character in it, so he wouldn't have been the, oh, he wouldn't have been the, even the only the Scotsman on camera in that scene. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's my small claim to fame. <laughs> Until Blazer, obviously. Oh, obviously. No, Commando. I know you through Commando, mate. Uh, Commando. Yeah, just started doing Commando. <laughs> Uh, my commando that came out um October. I so, saw that. Are you writing those? It's my Yeah, um Colin, Steve asked if you were writing those. Yeah, I'm writing commando, yeah. yeah. Ah. I saw that five little what was it called? Five little soldier boys. No, it's nice a little one. homage nice to, to um Agatha Christie. I think I think Commander would suit you down to the ground, Dan, wouldn't it? If you want to do some naval stories and stuff. Yeah, I think so. I've I've, I've got um the battle um is it the battle annual or special? And, and... Well, I can't find well, it. I can't find it's it. Some, it's, some, 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 when it came, when it came, it came out. It came, came out. out um, it came out um <laughs> about uh, about. I can't find it. But PJ, yeah, yeah. was that it? <laughs> yeah, I think that's um, it. Yeah, there's two different covers. So, but yeah, the one that P, yeah, PJ did the uh, Destroyer, yeah. didn't he? That's it, that's it. And I saw that and I thought, oh, you swine, you got it. That's, that looked like a good, fun story to do. But I would love to, I'd love to have a go at a, a, um, a, a full-on, you know, battleship story. You know, this, 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 it's like the story of the Bismarck. I know they made a film, Sink the Bismarck. Yeah. Back in the sixties, fifties, yeah. maybe, but I don't know why that hasn't been turned into a big Hollywood, you know, motion picture. Because the story of the whole Bismarck and the, the chasing this ship across the, the Atlantic, trying to sink it, and um, that's something I'd like to draw, something along them lines. Well, but I'm really just, happy. Just, but I'm really oh. happy doing the the, yeah. the, 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 the the jungle warfare in Burma. I'm quite happy doing that, to be honest. <laughs> I've, I've got a question for Steve. I wanted to ask. Go ahead. You ah. see if you first. Sir. I wanted to ask Dan a question. <laughs> yep. Dan, um, 
I hope one day you will take your loved one to San Francisco and down to San Diego. Oh, I'd love to. I'd love to. Um, we were going to go to San Francisco oh, a few years back. Um, we wanted to do New York and Fra San Francisco, but um, we couldn't afford it. We couldn't afford the two stops. Um, so we just stayed in New York for two weeks. Um, but yeah, we'd love to do San Francisco and do San Diego because I've, I've not been to a huge convention like San Diego. Um, I'm not even into Thought Bubble, so. <laughs> I was going to say, because um, in um, San Diego, they have um, the US fleet is moored there, basically, the seventh fleet. You oh, wow. see all these ships in the harbour. And um, I do believe in um, San Francisco, there's a submarine. It's true. I know this because I've been on it. You can go on one of the World War Two submarines, and they're I, like just small. I went to well, they've holiday. got they've got they've they've got um, in New York on the west west side. Um, they've got um, they've got the USS Intrepid there, which is a, a, a an aircraft oh. carrier which we went on board. And they've also got a, 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 I can't remember the name. Of, they've got a submarine there as well, but I can't remember the name of the submarine off the top of my head. But yeah, we went inside the submarine and. It's quite claustrophobic oh, in there. Yeah. And um, we, we had yeah. a, a family behind us who were obviously in some sort of hurry just to get through it. You know, I don't know why people turn <laughs> up for these, uh, yeah. you know, uh, these things just to get yeah. through it. And um, they're hushering us up, you know, come on, move, 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 move. And we're like, yeah. yeah, we paid to see this. But, yeah, that's fascinating. And going on to the Intrepid, when they've got, they've got um, all the Second World War fighters on there and Concorde and the space shuttle inside. That's that's quite incredible, but the ship itself is huge, huge. Oh, I haven't ship. done that. Yeah. Mm. Oh, it's well worth it. Well worth it. I'm not sure I if it was in the Second World War though. I think it was a. Uh, I think it was a uh, after the Second World War that uh, USS Intrepid. I, I, but did, I, I, could, I could, could you could you could, could you do a script, a, 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 a <laughs> you know, a Bismarck script or something along them lines? Is it something that would be interesting to you? <laughs> yes, I, I'd love to do that. I was thinking about the, the best tax, um, the best tax expenses claim ever was by John Wagner, who claimed <laughs> to go to Alcatraz and walk around there <laughs> because he was then reading the script. And <laughs> 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 as as it <laughs> you must ask him about that. But as soon as I read that script, I thought, well, oh, no, it, it, it is claiming some expenses. <laughs> <laughs> and of course he he read the I mean you could have talked to him about HMS Nightshade, surely that is the pucker script that you could maybe reinterpret. I think I've got that somewhere here as well, somewhere. Mm. Mm. Well well Dan's looking for that. You can ask you because I've I've I am on being along today. Hmm? Can I just ask I, I'll get annoyed if I don't and I've got a thirteen year old I'll get annoyed calling if I don't ask. So um uh, Steve McManus is one of the only guests that we've we've had on the show who uh, has a um, has a Wikipedia page. So, <laughs> so I um I had I had a wee look and um I noticed from um, Steve's Wikipedia page that he has spent time uh, editing Sonic the Comic and Ben Ten, which are uh, two of my thirteen year olds' favourite things ever. So, uh, <laughs> so I, I, I wanted to talk. I wanted to ask a wee bit about um, what was what was the what was it like going from two thousand AD, which has got sort of quintessentially British publication, to so Ben Ten's like a I can't remember the name of the, the team behind Ben Ten the cartoon, but I just wanted to know what your experiences were like editing sort of names that are associated with other media because obviously Ben Ten was a toy that. Toy turned cartoon, I think, and Sonic the comic is obviously a Sega computer game. How how was what was how did the editing of that compare to editing things like okay. Two okay, um, there's a big difference between those two brands, um, mm. uh, and I'll be as quick as I can. So we'll start with Ben Ten because that's. Um, this is a, um, a merchandise brand. They send you 
the um, the disc with all the images on, you don't have to get any artwork drawn. You just produce a magazine of of um, puzzles and stuff using their style guide. Uh, mm. It's as easy as peasy, you know. Uh, spot the difference, um, quizzes, and obviously there would be a little comic strip they sent me. That was just so easy. Um, so I think the comic was entirely different because it was quite a few years before. Um, IPC had bid for it, um, but it was given to Fleetway because uh, the license saw copyright promotions was doing Judge Dredd, so there was a bit of jiggery pokery there. And uh, Richard Burton was given the task of editing Sonic the Comic, and he, like 2000 in this instance, had to commission artists and writers. And um, he found some great artists and writers who were passionate about Sonic the Comic. And so effectively, he was recreating 2000 AD. He was buying artwork, buying scripts, getting a letter from the center of the printer. Um, and it was a huge success for Fleetway. He, he was a, a big video games man himself. And that kind of coalesced so sweetly that often um, there would be a meeting with the licensors representatives and the artists would know more about the character than the licensors representative and everyone would leave the meeting chuckling, you know. So that's the answer. I remember I remember my brother, my brother was um, um I used to get two thousand AD delivered from the paper boy. And um, my brother always got Sonic the Hedgehog, Sonic the Comic, and we both. I had I had a part of two thousand eight. Uh, he loved it. He loved it. Yeah, we lost you for a couple of moments here. Oh, okay. Sorry, I didn't say anything. <laughs> 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 but yeah, he, he, he. My brother loved Sonic the. I've actually. I actually kept thinking about buying him a, an original page even to this day i still think about i still troll ebay for an original page from sonic the comic or or do you remember the turtles teenage mutant hero turtles a comic in the in the early 90s was that uh, yeah. a page of this or, or, or page of of uh, sonic and that, as, a, as a present you know a christmas present or birthday present but um i could never find them I never find them i don't think mick mcmahon did it didn't he yeah, that's Sonic. right. When you meet up with Mick McMahon, he's quite happy to knock out a Sonic sketch. And I think it's some of his best work. You can really see where he started doing his new style from Sonic on onwards. Mm. Um, was that when you were working on it, Steve Mack? No, you see, I never worked on Sonic. It was Richard Burton then um, Apologies. Deborah Tate took over as editor and it was her because she and Robbie Morrison were on item and Deborah crossed over many kind of, you know, she knew Mick and I think it was a brave, brave thing of her to say, Mick, why don't you draw some song at the comic? Because um, I wouldn't have said it, I don't know why, would, you know, but she did and he did, he agreed and as you say, it came out nicely. So all credit mm. to Deborah Tate. Um, I, I remember uh, seeing an interview season. with I remember seeing an interview with Mick McMahon. On, I don't know if, if it was at the 40th Bash or something like that. One of these, one of these uh, big dudes, and um, he actually said that it was the only artwork he did that ever came out how, how he expected it to. And he was most happy with was Sonic the Sonic the Hedgehog pages. You know, you think of all those classics, Slain and all of that lot. And uh, he said his favourite pages were the Sonic the Hedgehog. Yeah, Marvel, Robin Smith. Speaking of Mr. McMahon, here is a here is a picture of our our very own Mr. McMahon. It's oh. drawn by Mr. McMahon. <laughs> Lovely. Uh, do you think I can get any money for that? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I imagine you could. <laughs> I've got a funeral to pay for, you know. Because I said at the beginning, I'm sixty-eight. <laughs> yeah, funerals are five grand a piece now. If, if if Jeff's able to pull up pictures from the interweb, I really like the one that um, a new a new guy who has been working with Sentinel, um, Ed Doyle, did of you, Steve. Do you remember your Christmas yes. card? 
the Tharg one. I don't know if you know that, Jeff, yes. but um, it's got Tharg's totally. face. It's, Tharg. it's just brilliant on an orange background. It's absolutely fabulous. And Steve always sends out really good Christmas cards. And <laughs> um, that was the one that year, wasn't it? It was brilliant. I'll see what I can. I'll see what I can do. Yeah, I, I don't mean to hog it. Um, Dan, Dan, you should do the same thing. And Colin, you should start your own Christmas card. And it becomes a fable, you know, oh, the Colin Maxwell Christmas card or the Dan Cornwell Christmas I card. Did do, I did do we'll one. I did do behind me, guys, because already. I'm I did do one. On... I, did, I did a rock. I did a rock Christmas card. You um, did actually. Yes. Yeah, and I did, I did. I did it. I did it. I did it for. I did. I did one for John, and uh, then he, he said, "Oh, we should print them." I was like, "Fair enough." <laughs> and we printed a load, but we haven't printed a load of them. But I've still got them sitting there. So, yeah. Well, you have to send them out. To I, I'm already working on this year's Christmas card with an artist who, who, who's very keen, and it's um, um it's going to be the title. You, this might give it away. Blue Christmas. Ah, oh. well, can I talk about giving things away in Lou Christmas? <laughs> oh, I need a copy of that, Ben. Oh, by the way, yeah, Dan, I know. I've seen the request, and it's going to be in the post, mate. And your t-shirt. No, no, I'll coming. send you the money. I've got to pay for it first, obviously. But uh... oh, mate, mate, well, that's fine. But I mean, isn't Lou? Isn't Lou oh. just a fantastic talent? I mean, yeah. you know, he's just the best man. Mm. I mean, so there we go. That yeah, is, of course, that, no, no problem. That, did, didn't that come out uh, just after Christmas, though? It, <laughs> yeah, it was that classic thing. We're calling it the winter special. Because <laughs> that is such a perfect cover for Christmas. That is such a perfect cover. Yeah. yeah I'd actually you. love to see Lou do a rock, actually, to do rock or, or something among them lines. Yeah, yeah, He's yeah. He's such a good yeah. artist. Yeah, such a nice guy as well. Such yeah, nice yeah, guy. absolutely diamond. But this is the thing Steve's alluding to, not being able to sell things. And we had a chat on our show. And I think we can all say this. Aren't we missing conventions? Aren't we just missing getting out and meeting everybody? Yeah. You know, it's just, oh, dear. Well, do you reckon it's going to happen this year? Or do you reckon it's going to be 22 before we see anyone? I went to, there was one in February. I went to a call in last year. And then you did one a couple of weeks later that me and my youngest came to see you. Yep. And then that was it. And it's like, so, and that, I remember at the start of a, at the start of lockdown, it being having this kind of in, inherent feeling that it was all going to kind of be over by Christmas. Mm. And the fact that we're now <laughs> moved into next year and there's a, it sounds like it's going to be, you know, what you say, 22, Dan, until we, we start having a, yeah. The thing, the thing is, it's a lot of people's income as well. You know, you think um, people who do independent comics, like I said to Ben in the last podcast we had. You know, the seventy-seven has been very successful, um, but it would be even more so if he would, if it had been launched at a convention to start, because it's meant to be launched at Lawless last year now. Um, yeah. And the foot, you know, as much as Facebook is good for, for promoting things, you can't beat footfall at a convention. You know, you can sell, yeah. you know, I reckon the 77 would have sold, you know, 100 copies at one convention alone. So thank you, Dan. Absolutely. And then you look at the big ones like Thought Bubble. So yes, I, I bumped into you guys and I bumped into Nick Roach and Steve Austin, and there's a whole line of people who I knew. And they just said that these places that you choose the right ones. And you're working all weekend and you're selling mm. all weekend and, and mm. all of that's gone, hasn't it? I feel yeah, because you said Dan, didn't you say your last one was was it on the south coast you did? And that No, it was it was Cheltenham. It was um in Cheltenham. Cheltenham. Right. Um I've forgotten the name of it now. Um last yeah, it was start of February last yeah. year. So we got thought we bubble was, <laughs> thought bubble was my last one, and that's over a year and a half now, isn't it? It seems so yeah, long yeah. ago. But it was um, it was it was good. But the funny thing was, uh, it was the same weekend I believe as the Cheltenham Festival. And when we got back, a couple of weeks, two three weeks afterwards, obviously the the virus and the lockdown and all of this happened. 
And uh, they said one of the biggest spreaders in the country was the Cheltenham Festival. <laughs> and uh, I was like, well, th th it didn't say comic festival, thankfully, <laughs> because I was at the comic <laughs> festival. It mad hats, wasn't it? Like, it was at the hats that did it. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, it's, it's, that does seem a lifetime ago now, you know. It was only February last year, but... Um, the one before that, I went to Malta. So it was. It just it all seems such a long time, a different world, and such a long time ago now. The, 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 I the wonder whether we'll be able yeah. to travel to one out of the country first. You know. Well, th th this is another thing. I remember talking to Paul Trimble about um, conventions and organising them because you've got to be an absolute nutter to want to do that, in my <laughs> opinion. Um, but I was talking to him, and he said that the. the, the the logistics in all of it is, is is a nightmare, but now after Brexit, it's people have got to get visas and things like that now to get people and and, and it, it, especially going to Europe and goodness what else, it's just the whole thing is going to be much. More, I think he said to me, he goes, you, you, you probably won't be able to get as big the big international stars stars over now because the cost of it might be more because of Brexit and all of that. Yeah, sure. there's all these other inherent costs that you don't you, you didn't need to consider before, isn't there? It's, mm. um, By the way, what? um, we've got a new scrunching dog in the house. <laughs> Jacko is now licensed. You've got to do something. Jacko and, um... is now licensed. That's oh, <laughs> not going well, is it? Jacko is now licensed to. Uh... Uh... Oh, is, that, is the that the preferred pronunciation, Steve? Shako? I thought it was Shako. I don't know. Well, you've got me well, I thought Rogue Trooper was Rouge Trooper. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I did for, for oh, all my teenage fun. years. I used to call it Rouge Trooper. Oh, right. <laughs> oh my God. Happy Warrior. No wonder you never got anywhere. <laughs> Uh, I was going to say, oh, Lou Stringer. The great thing about Lou is he's not very good at pool. In fact, he won't let he won't play you at pool, so he never loses his money to because. He, whereas Ben, you are a you are a pool shark. Shark. Ben, Are you a pool player? Ben, a you, I was. I, I was. Um, <laughs> I used to spend a lot of my uh, uh, teenage years and twenties in dirty spit and sawdust pubs playing pool every night. And every time I played or, and won, um, I was always called fluky. Oh, you're fluky. I go, well, you can't always be fluky. You know, there must be a, you know, a bit of credit. Um, but um, I used to like playing pool, but I haven't picked up a cue for, well, a good few years now, especially the last year, obviously, because uh, we can't go into pubs, can we? But does John Wagner not have a table in his house? Not when I went there the last time. He might have got. He's got. He's, he's got a shed. Well, it's not a shed. It's bigger than our house. But um, <laughs> he, he, he might have one in storage there somewhere. You just said the most. Uh, the most. Uh, is he? A, I mean, Colin talk a lot about imposter syndrome and stuff like that. Particularly as you like. Also, I mean, Colin started this podcast as the fact that the the comic shop in our town all of a sudden got a beer shop a couple of doors down, and that was basically the. The justification behind making a podcast. So the fact that we've got like Tharg on the show alongside the guy who's got a cover on 2000 AD and the guy who's got like the most exciting, you know, the, the editor of one of the most exciting comics of last year, all in one show. Um, Ten bears. <laughs> um, there's, 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 there's that imposter element for me in particular because I also view Colin as a really established figure in comics. Um, it's amazing just to hear you go. Fucking John Wagner's got like a shit that's as big as a house. And you're like, does he? Eh? Yeah, <laughs> no, he does. Uh, he, he invited us up. He invited us up because he's as big and scary as he is. He's um, the sweetest guy, and um, he invited us up a couple of years ago, I think it was, because um, we was going to the Oldham Comic Con. And he says, I'll oh, come up and stay at our place, and then I'll, we, I can drive us to the Oldham. It's only an hour from where he lived. I was like, oh, that's nice. He goes, it's a nice weekend away. Anyway, he pulled up, got lost, because he lives in the middle of nowhere. Um, 
and, and we got lost. And then I, to, I think I, I had to send him a text message and said, oh, we're at the bottom of this lane. Is this the lane we should be at the bottom of? And we have to find this post box or something. And um, <laughs> we, eventually we found it. And as we drove up, we parked up outside. He came out and greeted us. And um, he gave us a tour of his place. And, um, and he, just, it's just, he just said, oh, this is our shed. And it's, it's, it's huge. It's, it, it, it's bigger, it's bigger than a three, four bedroom house. And it's a shed, but you go in there and it's all lovely wooden beams. And uh, I have asked if you'd sell it and, uh, or we could rent it. But he goes, no, because you get lots yeah. of flies and birds in there and stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> It's got its own ecosystem. <laughs> <laughs> so there's yeah. a few things. I'm sure he taught me to play pool. All oh, right. Is he a good loser? Just asking. And um, <laughs> <laughs> he never loses. Um, no, does he not? He doesn't lose. He's, he's so good. Yeah, no. <laughs> no, he's a very, very good player. Uh, he's okay. got an advantage right. though hasn't he he's got the advantage he, he, he's he's almost got a, a, um like the bird's eye view of the table well david bishop did go down to his farmhouse once and, and won six game games on the trot but uh, i think that was just pure luck you know <laughs> <laughs> God, I tell you what, I wish I worked for 2000 AD in the 80s, 70s and 80s, yeah. because the stories and the, 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 the um, you know, when, when, when I listen to the 2000 AD podcast and they talk to the legends like yourself, the stories of meeting up in the pub, you know, when, when artists before, you know, they, they take, they'd go up there on a train and hand in the artwork and things like that, and then they all go out to the pub. It's just... That sounds like bliss to me, absolutely. But okay, you probably end up losing your artwork, but you know, I mean, good night. <laughs> it, it was called The Rising Sun, the pub. And if I was at the table, yeah, queuing up, I'd raise my eyes, and who would be there at the other end of the table but Wagner, Tom Frame, <laughs> Steve Dillon, <laughs> man. And um, I wasn't seeing them as comic people, I was seeing them as opponents of them and i knew that <laughs> steve dillon but however good john wagner was steve dillon was the fucking best <laughs> <laughs> he pulled off shots you wouldn't know and the funny thing is, is he was probably the best comic artist as well <laughs> bastard <laughs> yeah it was uh extraordinary nights as I said, I said the other night, I miss it terribly, really. Anyway, it's... <laughs> yeah. Mm. Yeah, well, guys, was that one of those kind of old, um, sort of Fleet Street, kind of off Fleet Street pubs, Steve? Or was that when you'd moved to King's Reach and you're all down that end of the, of the road? Because you weren't far from Fleet Street, were you, historically? No, but this was when we were in King's Reach. I mean, there were several pubs, but the only one that had a pool table was the Rising Sun, which was without a doubt <laughs> the only one um that was oh it was the most awful pub but it had a pool table and um <laughs> and we took it over it, it, we ruled that pub it was like some hollywood <laughs> movie you know no one dared go in there except unless they had a 2000 ad badge on <laughs> you know, yeah. on the door. would that be a friday afternoon steve did the weekend kind of start early absolutely Friday afternoon at 12 o'clock. Oh, wow. Wow. Do you, see, do you see what I mean? It just sounds like such a good time. You know, nowadays, yeah. you, know, you know, I'm not taking it for granted. You know, working for 2000 ladies, a childhood dream. But um, it's, all, it's all via email now. It's not, you, you haven't got the, it hasn't got the personal touch like the stories mm. you hear. It's just all, you know, you send him, you know, I, I've mm. met, Matt Smith once. I've met a few of the other artists a couple of times at conventions, but um, it just seems the old days was such a, a close knit group of people and you know up for a party. Yeah, I, I, actually, I'll tell you who was quite good was Ian Gibson. He was quite a good pool player. Um, I can't remember, I don't think Brown or Dave or um. 
Mick. What about Kevin Neal? I thought he might be a bit of a cool player. Oh, look at that. He's found it. Uh, Just Googling away. (laughs) Is this the one, Steve? No, it's not that. No, no, no. no. Oh, no. No, no, Years and years ago, mate. (laughs) It's probably a McDonald's now or something. (laughs) It's not there, I'll tell you that. But oh, Kevin was a pub man. <laughs> just, just um, oh, obviously. Yeah, actually, we're... I take that back here. Here, no, but don't, don't worry, guys. Um... It's probably, <laughs> probably a trendy wine bar now. That's how, what happens yeah. all to all the, the pubs down our way. Yeah. They turn into trendy wine bars or co ops. <laughs> I just like exactly. the. Yeah. There was a nice wee yeah. segue into okay, gear there. If I could find the, if I could find the, the rising sun front there. But. <laughs> well, I was going to ask. Well, so so Dan, what's John John Wagner's favourite tipple? As in beer or in? Uh, well, well, he 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 normally the times I go out, he's he's either on. Uh, no 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 no! I thought it was a Peroni then. <laughs> Peroni. <laughs> um, he likes a he likes a Peroni and. Um, uh, it generally goes Peroni, then wine, red wine, um, and then he always finishes a night off with a brandy. Always finishes a night off with a brandy. Um, big double brandy. But it's normally, yeah. it's normally a Peroni he likes, lager-wise, and uh, 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 yeah, red wine. But I'm sure he'll drink anything. And you're on the Corona tonight. You're a very on-brand Corona. <laughs> they, <Yeah. laughs> they're cheap. They're cheap. They're cheap. Yeah. Did, 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 yeah. did everyone see that Facebook post of quite a while ago where, oh, you know, when everyone's panic buying bog rolled and all of that lot, but you go down the beer aisle and all the beer's been obviously bought, apart from there's a big stack of Corona still sitting there. <laughs> <laughs> My favourite one was, was, was inside of a fridge and there was like a... All the vegetables in the fridge were in one corner wearing masks, and there was a <laughs> bunch of <beer> there. <laughs> So my my Kirsty asked me to to say because I'm not drinking beer, but she is. So I got her this today. So Atomic IPA, right. okay, Apollo brew, Apollo hops and citrus and anyway. So she said she wanted me to feature that because you you guys like your kind of rarefied beers, isn't that right? What have you What are you drinking yeah, we, there, mate? We the other half of the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Colin, what are you drinking? I I've got um this is uh, from Ferry Brewery, which is just next to the fourth fourth rail bridge. So the famous bridge, and they've got a little brewery there. And one of my local shops has started selling their stuff. It's a New England IPA. What did you think of that shop, Colin? So, so, sorry for uh, the, the part of the, co- the the podcast where we blather about small corner shops in Dunfermline. <laughs> <laughs> that, uh, that shop in Twix is amazing, eh? <laughs> yeah, the, yeah, it's just a little premier corner shop. And it's got this huge section of craft beer from, from a few of the local uh, breweries. And you just don't get that. I don't know whose idea it was to get the beer in, but good on them. Is it an acquired taste, isn't it, though? These these home, not, okay, they're not home brewed, but you know what I mean. Um, I, I, I struggle with them. You know, if I, there's 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 a nice one down here. We went to this, there's this pub in the countryside and we go every Christmas Eve. And we've been doing it for about 20 years, 20, 25 years. And they got taken over and, um, Everything they've got, they won't do. They don't do anything you can buy off out the supermarket. So everything is locally brewed beers. But and it, you know when you do the little tasters, you give you little testers to try. They're, they're such a, a much stronger flavour. I find they're so much stronger or, or sweeter or one of the two. And and I couldn't drink a whole pint of this whatever it was. I can't remember what it was called. The Badger's Thumb or something. And um, it, 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 it was just too rich, is it? Maybe rich. It's an acquired taste, do you think? Well, I think it depends on the beer. Um, yeah. Um, I remember like, saying to them, I felt, I felt so stupid. I go, you got, it, it tastes like carling. <laughs> it's all about time and place, though, isn't it? So, like, like um, carling. Obviously, like... <laughs> There's a time and a place where you're you're in a pub and you're just like I, I just fancy a lager and I just want to I just want to wire through something mm. that's special in that um 
Also, also, I, I love a Guinness. I see Steve's drinking the Guinness there. I adore Guinness. Um, oh, but we, I, I, we we went to, we went to to, to Ennis, in a skinning comic convention um, four years ago, and um, as usual before these conventions, you drink shed loads the night before, which I've so, since I've decided now I don't, I'm not going to do that anymore because my sketches on the Saturday become awful. Um, <laughs> but anyway, I was drinking Guinness all night, and then I spent the rest of the night in the hotel rolling around on the floor with. IBS and it really so now every time I drink Guinness I just get bloody cramps in my stomach and God as well so I have to take these yeah. pills and whatnot because it's so, I don't think again maybe it's because it's just too rich for me so that's it that's Dan yeah. guys our, um, there is Nidhi alienating 50% of our listenership that's <laughs> <week. laughs> <laughs> I love oh, it though oh, well I'm talking <laughs> Talking of the impoverished, um, I, this is what I have to drink after my first Guinness. So I, I, um, I'm on this. Um... <laughs> that was amazing. Is that aloe vera water? <laughs> <laughs> What's that? Yes, it, it goes down well. It's a soothing <laughs> toner down. Oh, okay. <laughs> I need to. I, I, I normally I can't remember what you like. I normally have to have these pills. <laughs> <laughs> to help my stomach, that is to help my well, stomach. Feel... Dude, dude, you need acid reflux pills. I thought yeah, got... at the beginning, I'm an expert on health now. You need, you got them, acid reflux. Yeah. The, 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 I've, got, I've got, um, I'm on, I'm, I'm going to talk about my medical history now. I'm on <laughs> prescription pills for my stomach, but I also yeah. got these, is it bus, is it buscapan? <laughs> um, <laughs> I think it's yes, Buscapan, I, I think it, I yeah, so, so, so it's just, it sounds ridiculous, so now if I do decide to, to go for Guinness for a night, I have to make sure I have a Buscapan at the end of it, it's like a, you know, John Wagner has a, a brandy and I have a Buscapan. Dude, <laughs> <laughs> you're meant to have it before the drink, not after. Oh, <laughs> All the breaking comics here, guys. Oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well done. Um, I, I'm really, really, I'm really sorry that to, to Benske, Benske, but I wasn't able to find um, what you asked me to look for earlier. But I did find this. Um... Oh, there we go. Yes, <laughs> that's the one. Available yeah, on Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> And they work. I see, I see PJ Holden keeps putting on face on Twitter that he keeps he's suffering from serious stomach pains, cramps, and whatnot. And I did suggest to him, so I'm I'm, I'm like a salesman for them. Busker pad, it works. <laughs> you should you should you should contact them and just say, look, I think mm. Christmas is needy. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I had one Christmas night after all those homebrew beers as well. <laughs> So with homebrew beers, um, I'm really I'm loving the fact that uh, <laughs> so um, we have a shop in the Vermont that uh, I used to I used to associate with um, when, I would, when I used to go see them for on athletic play football um, with my with, with my kids. I would go through the park past the shop in a, a street in the called Appen Crescent. We'd walk past the shop. We'd maybe nip in there. Um, and I'd get my son a couple of packets of crisps and stuff just so that we went to see Dunfermline play football. He wasn't, when he got bored, he had something to eat. That shop is now, I don't know if Colin's been in yet, but when you walk in, there's no sweets, there's no crisps, there's no anything other than these kegs of beer. So, like, it's this and is it, um, it's, I think it's called Pint Mate or Pint Friend or something like that. There's a brand of machine that it costs a couple hundred quid and you set up in your kitchen and then you can then go on and buy like plug-in of like Heineken or Budweiser or a like, tiny rebel have got their their cali their, their cali pail and you plug it in. But I went into the shop today because we're friends with Beef in um, Brewing who are a, a brewer in Kenny Beef um and they've got a couple of their kegs. So that this is a 7.2 percent New England IPA. Um, from Beef Brewing that called Dance Monkey, which is probably my favourite beer at the moment. Um, but I went into the shop today to buy a keg, and it's just wall to wall of these big metal 
discs that you buy and you plug into this machine and you can pour yourself tea. <laughs> <laughs> is, is there a deposit, um, Jeff, on those um, on those kegs? Do you do you return them for money? Well, like um, a gas canister. No, I'm not sure about the actual <laughs> canister. But see, see these kegs. Obviously, me and um, these um, me and Colin are friends with Ian, who is the the, the brewer and the owner of Beef Brewing. So I've been up a few times to the brewery because it's only three or four miles. Where's Kevin Beef from here? Five miles? Three, four, and five miles? Like that, yeah. Yeah. yeah it, um, so when I've gone in to buy beer from him, I have given him kegs of stuff I've already used. Like, yeah, and I think he, he, can, he can industrial wash them and reuse them. Yeah. Which is great because um, as, a, as the husband of a wife that owns a, a plastic free waste, a waste reduction shop, be able to drink and drink alcohol without making any wastage is also quite a good thing. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, what, um, what, 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 what do you what do you guys think of Belgian beers? Because we're, on our honeymoon, we we have family friends who owned uh, they owned a property in Depana, and uh, they said you can stay there for for for, for a, a week or a long weekend. I can't remember how long it was now. And um, they said there's beers in the fridge. There's beers, lots of beers there as well. And um, there was nothing but, is it Trappist Monk beer? <laughs> Which it was, it was, it was something yes. like nine, 9%. Nine and it, it, it you, I, again, I, I've got a delicate stomach. Um, I couldn't drink a whole one because it was just so rich. But um, that's all they had in their, in their, in their house was this Trappist Monk 9%. I think some of it was twelve percent, and that's special brew, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> sure, yeah. Effectively, well, I think Ben will know. Ben will know that Ben will know it's called a blonde beer. Mm. Is that right, Ben? But do you know what, Steve? Beer? I was thinking about. I was thinking what connects me and you and these two guys. The Bucky. <laughs> Yeah, because everyone in Scotland, this is the whole thing, isn't it? I drink the Bucky, yeah? Well, me and Steve come from where it brews, because he went to school there, and I lived on Dartmoor, and, and it's Buckfast Abbey, and uh, it's the tonic wine, oh. isn't it? So yeah. I don't know if you've ever drunk it, Dan. Have you seen this, Buckfast tonic wine? I don't it think I have. Stuff. It's evil stuff. It's about 12 to 15%, and it's just a nightmare. And uh, it was the scourge of Scotland about 20 years ago. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I don't. I, don't, it's, so it's, I, I, I used to drink. I used to drink uh, 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 in these spit and sawdust pubs. I used to frequent um, tenant super, um, uh, uh, paint stripper. Is that what you want? Buck Bass in Scotland and Peters is the main of our future in his hand. Hmm? Dan, are you moving house? Sorry? Are you moving house? Are you uh, moving house? Eventually. Yes eventually. No? We, yes. We will be. I know where you need to go. You need to get yourself and your lovely partner down to Devon. Oh, I know. Now, Jock, the world's most, the world's most brilliant artist, lives there in Totnes. You and he, you could share his studio, man. Properties are that much expensive. Does yep. he know and this? I could come. Not yet. You sent me. I just turn up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Saying, um, Dan I'm Henry is in Tinmouth, about ten miles to the east, and he's he, he's a cool yeah. guy. So there could be a like a long clave of Devon, a Devon uh, two thousand eighteen. Doesn't, doesn't doesn't Henry Flint live down that way? That's right. Yeah. Yeah, my old town. Well, I used to live in Cheltenham. It's near enough. Keck's just up the road in Taunton. Yeah. Oh, okay. We had a our yeah, guest yeah. and hmm? we, had, we had we had the guest we had um, the USUK Chronicles US UK Chronicle um, podcast on last week, and uh, Tom, who's their host, he was in Cheltenham. Oh yeah, it's it's we went we went there like I said for the Comic Con last last February, and um, I hadn't been up to Cheltenham since we moved to Brighton when I was 
16, 14 in 1989. Um, so we went, I'd been back there for years and years. And so we went back there and we went to, well, I was going to say my old haunts, but when you're 14, you don't have haunts. You know, it's not, <laughs> this is a pub I've drunk in. Um, it's just like, this is, my, this is my old primary school um, and things like that and where we used to live. Um, still, a, still a lovely, lovely town. Um, parts of it, anyway. Parts of it is a lovely town. In the outskirts around, there's a, a, there's a lovely place I'd love to move to one day called Porton on the Water. Don't know if everyone's heard of that. Um, yeah. No, it's a beautiful place and mm. Malvern and things like that. But um, we did we did watch a, a, a place in the country and they did Devon. They did an area in Devon, but apparently Devon's got the same kind of house prices as down here has. And you know it's got that yeah. desirability, apparently. Yeah, uh, yeah, I guess so. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. It was me who found Jock. You know, he they came up to uh, the Glasgow Convention Colony, didn't they? And um, they said they went to um, um, yes. Andy Diggle? Exactly. And he said that, uh, yeah. <laughs> no, the, the artist, sorry, Glenn Fabry, he was at the bar, of course, Glenn would be, and he said, oh, don't bother me, go and find Steve McManus, you're far too good. <laughs> I'm not letting you in. So they came and found me, and, um, well, he told me, and then I said, oh, I'm looking for them. And anyway, so eventually, Jock and Dom, Jock Dom as well, never forget Dom. And it, eventually, they got a, a page and a summer special and stuff. And um, how old was um, uh, Jock when you met him? I, I, well, I reckon they were youngsters. I would, this would, I would say he was about nineteen. Wow. Yes. Well. Um. Yeah. And you, yeah, and I know that Steve, um, Steve Dillon um worked at warrior first but he was very young when he started at 2000 wasn't he steve yeah well steve um was a one himself um and uh, uh which I, I i applaud in a way um uh, I, when you're that talented you're not gonna you just got, you're so talented you can't it was a, it was just like a, a free a, a free person in the world, and he's, yeah, uh, occasionally yeah. draw this great stuff. Um, I mean, some of his earliest work. You look on his Judge Dread, you know, Damnation and all that. The Werewolf story. I mean, you know, and the guy was twenty, twenty one when he did that. You know, it's just, just nuts. Absolutely nuts. Brilliant stuff. He, he's he, he, he well, for not, me. He's he's he, when, whenever I see his artwork in the collection, Steve Dillon's artwork, it's it's so inspiring. You, you know, the, 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 he was such. Um, I know his later work was um, coloured. You know, like when he went on to do Preacher and things like that. Um, mm -hmm. But his black and white work, he was such a master of of the the, the the black and white, the light and the dark, the shadows and all of that. Like he, his page layouts are perfect and beautiful, and it's just such a master. So when, whenever I get any kind of artist block, any time, I, I'm like, oh god, you know. John said to me, just go for a walk or whatever. I I, I, I go for a walk, come back, and I always put out a bit of Steve Dillon you know, um, Choir of the Werewolf or something like that, just to look at it and I'll just go, yeah. oh, there we go. It, it, it kind of, it's like inspiring. It just gives you so, so much inspiration to, you know, get off. And like you say, he was so young when he did that. You know, he's in his teens, late teens. Yeah. And there's that lovely story, isn't there, that don't need to ask Steve to recant it, but we know it, don't we, where Steve Dillon or someone lost the artwork and didn't he redo the whole five pages in a weekend? And then they, there's a, I've seen an article where they <laughs> match found artwork with the redone artwork and your opinion is that the redone artwork is better and he did five pages in a weekend it's amazing you know just out there yeah. that's well, a question that's another you, story so steve sorry i've just got a question um i i, I know when we have when we had bensky on the, the podcast in the past he's, <laughs> talked, he's, he's talked he's talked about um i remember we had good stuff coming you talked about um having the um 
been able to offer like a platform within the, uh, a big part of the 77 was offering a platform for up and coming talent and being able to offer just another avenue for for creative types to to produce things is there anyone within your tit within your tenure in comics steve that you're you're really proud of that you you, you maybe gave them an opportunity or you maybe offered them a job and then, and and you've seen them go on to do quite incredible things that's such a good question it's and a I can answer question. It quite <laughs> quickly on the writing it, well it's a screw up but i'll take it um on the writing side john smith i still stand by john smith who swimming wrote, in blood's a masterpiece yeah, yeah exactly uh, <laughs> i don't know if he, if he should be writing comics but um i stand by uh and uh actually john wagner said a very funny thing he said watch out for his left when you met him but that's another story um <laughs> in terms of the artwork um that's john for you <laughs> um <laughs> in terms of sorry <laughs> Stop it, Mr. Wagner. Um, the flaming Scots. Hey, no, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, artist, darling, um, darling. Oh God, I'm getting an auto, um, that kind of mode. Uh, anyone who ever got a script sent from me, bless. I wish them well, and I hope they get on with it. And um, uh, so it was some you know it's just I, I had an interview the other night where they said well what did you do and i said well at the end of the day i was a production editor and i thought about it overnight as we've all said we go to bed thinking like mad can't sleep and i've decided that my job was to schedule the talent not to produce it to schedule it yeah yeah is that your answer okay Steve, last question. I thought it was interesting how Ben, Ben, as you were explaining that, he's nodding like his, his neck was going to snap off. Like. Well, well, when question you question quick. Yeah, but Dan, go ahead, mate. Yeah, I was just going to say, you know, um, it's like the two, the, the two, you know, whenever they do a poll on the favourite 2000 AD droids, um, generally, Mick McMahon and Carlos come top generally uh closely followed by steve dylan and you know uh, uh and things like what do you think it is you know you got steve Dillon hit america and done well in on on stateside and a lot of two that you know jock obviously a lot of these artists do hit the ground running when they get to america why do you think the two biggest names for 2000 ad in artist wise anyway um in carlos and 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 mick mcmahon why do you think they weren't as huge over there being you know as big as they are here why do you think they didn't quite hit the ground over there or i, I know Car i spoke to carlos once before and he said he wasn't overly interested in working for the u.s market but you know money talks a lot of the time doesn't it i just wondered what you thought why you thought they two those two didn't quite hit the ground well i um, I think Carlos is right. He wasn't that bothered. Um, his style was European. In fact, thoroughly Spanish, um, if you will. So his, um, his, his, his page layouts were Carlos. They weren't six grid layouts. Um, who, who was the other one? Uh, um, Mick McMahon. Well, again, you know, Max and Lawrence himself. Um, uh, he did some great stuff on uh, the uh, for John on um, the American, but at the time it didn't it didn't really cross over, did it? It's about mm. crossovering. Uh, Brown Bond and Steve mm. were more kind of like could do that American fixed frame stuff and then just put a bit of brick into it, and, and that's what the Americans like because they got a bit of. Chili in there, in those <laughs> nine friend pages, and Dave as well, of course. Mm. Okay, I always, well, I always, I just, I just always wondered because they're so, they're so, so pr prolific and such huge names over here. 
and um, it's, it's it, it, and the Americans have got a great way of cherry picking talent. And I just wondered, like I said, I know Carlos said he wasn't overly interested in working for the American market when I spoke to him, and it, it's just it's just one of those funny things. I just thought, you know, they would have been huge in the, in America. Well, you know, Dan, I, I, I think it was probably quite kind of like, well, he's a great artist, but he's not American. And that would be in respect to both of those people. Whereas yeah, Dave Gibbons, Brown, they could say, oh, yeah, we can absorb this guy into our culture. So the Americans never took a chance early on on um, different artwork and until kind of like individual companies like Epic began to uh, bring these guys in and show that uh, comics didn't always have to be that kind of uh, uh, you know, crew cut thing. Um, mm. Yeah. I'll, I'll, be honest, I, I'll be honest. I'll be honest. I, I, I couldn't probably see Carlos um, doing Superman or um, Spider-Man. I I, I, yeah. Like you say, he's got a very, he has got a very European style. Um, yeah. Probably it's the same with Mech to a degree as well. I, They're I not superhero so. artists, are they? No, nor even well, exactly superhero artists. So that was America's loss, I guess. Mm. One of the and only titles, yeah, yeah. yeah, one of the only titles I pick up at the moment, and I'm not a big superhero buyer at all. For me, it ended with uh, Watchmen, as far as I'm concerned. Um, is Liam Sharp's. Uh, um, Green Wonder Lantern. Woman. Oh, Green oh, Lantern. Yeah. Green Lantern. Now, isn't he going over to Conan, which is my middle name? So I'm like all over that. Um, <laughs> but he's really taken on board and, and, and subsumed himself in the American market. And of course, he came from 2000, didn't he? Liam Sharp. He's just awesome. He's a really good artist. Oh, I, remember, I remember Liam coming into the office, um, a young guy, and um, you know, we, we got on great straight away and um he's a very very nice person and um he was uh self-effacing about his artwork and he told me he'd studied under oh god one of those damn dare artists or oh, don lawrence no don lawrence that's right um that kind of raised, raised my hackles a bit actually when he said that because i thought well you know what else <laughs> people are just coming out of the streets man i don't want to... <laughs> Uh, people from that kind of a thing but um then he did some great work for, for the 2000 AD crisis or whatever and uh, mm. i think you know if we were ever to meet today we'd give each other a handshake <laughs> <laughs> you see you, you, you think to yourself of the amount of british creators that go over and become you know world known creators and they all started off in British comics, and um, it's, it's you know, I remember I saw a, a, again, it's a poll on the greatest artists of all time. Um, and I think Frank quietly came second in, in its greatest artists of all time. And you're like, and that, I, and I did agree because I thought, you know, that's, that's one artist I look, I buy anything, and apparently, any. He, he, any comic he does, you know, um, for the US market anyway, it's always, and, and he, he now cherry picks what he wants to do, because he can, um, and anything he does for the US market at the moment, it becomes like the number one seller of that year. Wow. Yeah, that, that's kidding. a situation my, to be in, isn't my it? Last, my last travel in the UK before COVID was up to Glasgow, where my twin brother lives, and we went to the Kelvin Grove, and there's an exhibition of yeah. Frank Quietly's work, and there is the bestest Superman you've ever seen in your life. And the prints, so these are just prints, right? Signed mm -hmm. prints, 800 quid. Whoa! For a print signed. Wow. wow. But you look at it and you <laughs> Ten quid, mine. Ten, ten no. quid. This is in aid of the um, Kelvin Grove um, fund or something. There's a picture yeah. of Superman flying over the Kelvin Grove, yeah, which is kind of cool. It's kind of cool. Yeah. Yeah, I was. In the office, you, um... you talked about uh, artists, uh, Dan. There, because um, one of my um, one of my favorite other Dan's is Dan Abnett, and I oh, okay, yeah. Imagine he had a very similar um, I imagine he you were talking about kind of artists there and moving over to America, but then what um, 
the, it's, it kind of takes me back to my original question for Steve. Um, I think if you look at Dan Abnett and you think of he is a he's a name that many people won't know. I think a lot of people throughout the world won't know. But actually, if you, if you looked at what he has contributed, yeah, he's to, got a body of work. Yeah, but even things like um, if you if you if if you, if, if he took a step back and you closed up and you went, what has Dan Abnett given us? You'd be able to look at it and go, like the Guardians of the Galaxy and <laughs> stuff like that. And then, <laughs> um, I, I think um, uh, it's it's interesting that these um, I I just wonder what like because I know you I know obviously as an artist you you, you, uh, you you're you're probably recognising um, a lot of art a lot of artists' contributions when they move over to the US. I wonder I wonder if writers get a, a similar kind of recognition or. Or lack thereof, or not, as a. Mm. Well, they must do. They must do. You know, you got Warren Ed, Warren Ellis is doing well out there, isn't he? And obviously, Gaiman and uh, or Gaiman, however he pronounces his, his, his name, um, uh, the yeah, British Mark writers, Miller. Mark mm. Miller. Yeah, did, didn't he yeah. do the the, um, the Marvel Cinematic Universe or something? Yeah. Um, and I think like, Patrick O'Brien. <laughs> you know, so well, I, I, I think. Yeah. The, 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 there was that, that. What was it? The the the, um, the British invasion in what year was that? In the eighties? Was that eighties? Late eighties? Early nineties? And um, it kind of yeah. hasn't. It hasn't really stopped, is it? It's still. No, they they still come over and cherry pick. You know the the the, the best artists or writers at the time. Um, which is a shame for 2000 AD because, you know, I remember someone asked me um, in, 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 a, in an interview, said, oh, would, would you ever go over to work for the American market? And I, go, and I, I remember saying I've, I've never had the intention to do that. My dream was 2000 AD. That's my dream, to work for 2000 AD. Um, but I can't say, if I suddenly got an email from DC or Image Comics or Marvel, Saying we're going to pay you four five hundred pound a page to do the pencils. Um, obviously, money yeah. talks, doesn't it? It's hard yeah. not to, to say. You know, you've got to be crazy to to say no. But you'd, it's not what I'd necessarily want to do. And the fact that two thousand eighty, it happens to two thousand eighty, is is a shame. But. Um, that's because the British market, whereas in the eighties was really strong, nowadays it's not quite as strong. Although it's making its resurgence, isn't it? You know, with the seventy-seven and all these independent comics coming out, Kickstarter's helping that immensely. Um, I still think my biggest gripe is we can't get our as creators books into into the 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 the, the, the mainstream, as in you know, because we lost the corner shops now, pretty much they're all Tesco's and co-ops. We can't get our books on the shelves in those mm. kind of places. We can't get our books into WH Smith. It costs John Wagner told me it costs about twenty odd grand just to get a book onto the shelf in WH Smith. And what independent small independent publishers got twenty grand to spend on one book okay. with no guarantee it's gonna sell. So um yeah. that's why a lot of artists and writers end up going over to the States because the money's big and you got more chance of seeing print, I suppose, if you like. So would you do it, Dan? As I just said, money talks. You know, I, my dream's two thousand AD. My dream's two thousand AD. Judge Dredd. You know, the fact I'm doing Judge Dredd. I'm, and yeah. but if, like I said, if I got an email from, you know, uh, the editor of DC or Marvel or, in, or who, any of those American markets, off, it's just money talks. You know, four hundred pound a page, five hundred pound a page. You, you you can't. It's it's you know, two two grand a week for me. Because I do a page a day or two, you know, it's yeah. so it's a lot of money, and you got to um, you got to think financially, haven't you? You know, mortgages to pay, yeah. and so I can expect the rest of those pages in four days. Is that what you're saying, Dan? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, well, what, 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 what was that? What was that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you broke up. Yeah, I can't hear you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh. <laughs> What a nightmare! And a you you will get them. You will the get them by. The <laughs> you will get them. You will get them by middle of next week. I would say it's really? going to be within by the end of that. Here we go. It's, it's going to get longer and longer. It's going to be by the end of next week. 
By the way, I said this earlier, Colin, thank you for getting your artwork in before the deadline. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> Colin, Colin, my deadline was the end of February. <laughs> so if I get it by the end of the week, it's 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 a month early. <laughs> <laughs> but you will get it. You will get it. You will get it. I'm sitting with a beer and the uh, of a ben, ben, maybe Colin can write something for the annual because he's a, a writer too for the 77 annual. Maybe Colin, Colin could yeah. write something. Yeah, I would absolutely love to write something because, uh, and, and you know, Dan, Dan was saying he's got his dream job kind of doing 2000 AD. And writing for Commando was, was my was my dream job as well, and you know, so yeah. that, that's been achieved, and um, I'll keep at it. But yeah, I'm interested to do lots of other stuff as well. What a title Commando is! Is it five and a half thousand editions they've they they brought out now? <laughs> yeah, sixty years years old this year. Just amazing. I don't think it gets the credit it should get. No, I don't think so either. No. It's pretty amazing that it's still still on the go and uh, has a huge following. And I've discovered how many people love it abroad mm. as well. What, what do you do next then? So see, see, as somebody as somebody that's like got like I've only been writing comics for a year, right? And what's it like for like Dan and Colin and I assume Ben and Steve at some point in your careers to like have targets or have goals and then to smash them. So obviously, Colin, you said yours was um, Commando. Dan, you said you, you wanted something in 2018. You know, I'm I'm really excited about the fact that, like, as somebody that hosts quite a quite a a niche podcast, I'm going to go to my local comic book shop and as a sub subscriber of 2018, I'm going to pick up something that you you drew. Mm. That, you know what I mean? That's absolutely incredible. I love being able to go to my local comic book shop and buy stuff that I know, like, my best friend wrote. <laughs> yeah. I think we always, we always look to the people who came before you and say, I want to do, I want to emulate what they did. So, for me, it's what Steve did, isn't it? You know, um, yeah. and anyone who, I mean, goodness me, 10 years at the helm of the galaxy's greatest comic. I mean, you know, and I know, and, and bless him, I know Matt Smith's done 20 years. It's not quite the same beast, though, is it, as far as I'm concerned? And that's probably sacrilegious to some people. But there again, for me, to get Dan to produce work for a comic that Steve's written about, it kind of ties it all together. So, you know, okay. I think it's kind of achievable, achievable goals and then move on, build on them. The funny thing is about, you know, because Steve's era, uh, editing, editing the 2000, it's the golden era. It, it's, it's the heyday of 2000 AD. Um, not that it's my job to comment on how 2000 AD is run, but... Um, it, it, it's never going to be able to compete with um, 77 to 91, that kind of era, because it's, it's a golden era to you guys. It's a golden era to me because we were young when we was reading it, and it's part of our history. Um, if you come back and do a podcast in 20 years, 30 years, Will there be kids who are reading it today saying, oh, the Matt Smith years are the golden years because we were young and, 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 and things like that. So I don't, I don't want to suggest it's, it's, that things were happening. It's, it's, it's hard. It's hard because, you know, no one's going to say that a Judge Dredd story out today is going to be as good as a Judge Dredd story from the golden days because it's... I was to question why that was, though, Dan. So, like... Um... Before I know that we're we're treadling on, and this is our longest podcast ever, as 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 in Kevin. But um, forever, never, never. It's, 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 a, question, it's, it's a question it's for Steve about like, when, when Steve was editor. So you said like the golden age was seventy seven to ninety one. I, I would probably agree. Um, what was happening in Britain at that time? <laughs> and then um, yeah, and um, I don't know. I think, yeah, a, lot I think of a lot of people were reading comics then. You know, Steve, what was the, what was the circulation then? We got me, you know, 100, 200,000 a week. I think so. Yes, Dan. Yes, uh, it was. Everyone was making money, and the kids were enjoying it. Uh, 
it was a I think it's it was still a, a, a weekly thing for a child, a young child. Their brother may have been going up to a punk disco, but the the younger mm. ones were still buying the comics. When I, when when I was when I was ten, sort of nine years old, when Action and Two Thousand AD just started, I was buying that and reading um, Battle and Warlord and Victor and Tiger and striker uh, soccer football ones you know not that i bought them all and i'm just saying what what choice is there now you know i love i love the 77 of course but it comes out every now and again pat mills is spacewalk fantastic but it's we're waiting for another one you know it's like i guess the Here kids we go. Are playing, what are they doing i don't know here's a question for all of you then all right um in in, in the seven in the 70s and 80s 2000 AD was breaking ground. You know, it was it was edge of your seat comics. It was risky. It was it was in the news when something happened, and you know things like that, right? In today's culture, everything is it has to be calmed down, doesn't it? It has to be a, a, a kind of a watered down because, it, f f and it, you know, rightly or wrongly, for for for. for in case they offend anyone, you know, it's too violent, it's too, it's too this, it's too that. Could 2000 AD exist now as it did back then without it being pulled off the shelves, do you think? Or, or, or uh, you know, cancelled or banned, maybe? Maybe not. For my, my opinion and, um, would be that maybe it would, it would manage in sort of small doses. So there was a um, there was I talked about it last month. There was there was a series of 2000 ADs, sort of late November, early December, that all had there was quite a clear, or at least I felt quite a clear social argument that they were trying to make. Um, I think every so often that's okay, but um, in current comics, whereas I think there's more of an argument. I think I think the argument was being made made more in the eighties when also when when Steve was in charge and then um, I don't I don't know if I'm I'm reading between the lines a wee bit too much <laughs> but there was um there was there was, there was maybe more social consciousness with regards to two thousand AD in that as you say that golden era between seventy seven and eighty one um which maybe just the way that politics and and society and culture have moved on you wouldn't be able to like like you say produce it the same that you could have back then but mm. certainly there was um there was a couple of progs in early december and i talked about it with colin there was a couple of progs early december that i was like oof that's really bitey <laughs> like as a as a member of um as as a as a scottish young man or middle-aged man living in in the uk i'm finding 2000 ad to be quite socially biting right now <laughs> um, <Yeah. laughs> um, mm. I, and i don't know i don't know if there was i don't know if there was a conscious movement of that in the late 70s throughout the 80s but um having read that then yeah I please do that in 25 words <laughs> please do <laughs> does anyone mind if i answer this in 25 words okay it's, this is so easy. Um, John and Alan, John Wagner and Alan Grant did the, the satire. They took the piss out of itself. Uh, Pat did the historical stuff and Jerry Finley Day wrote the proper comics. Then we had Alan Moore came on with a kind of different angle and um, then later go off and it's as simple as that. Were, that's all there was to it. And what, Could it happen what a lineup of names? Wow! Yeah, 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 yeah. That's a that's a number one center there, isn't it? I know. No, it was like, there's like that. You've just taken years and years of um of of discussion in um dormitories and university lecture halls, and you've gone like here's twenty five words. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah. Um, Thank Dan you. Dan, interest question: do you, do you think you could do what you did in the eighties now, Steve? Is there? I'm going to play the card I said at the beginning of this that I'm 68 years old and I have no idea. <laughs> Amazing. And the Godfather because, because... retired. <laughs> yeah. 
because it's it, it's it's. I just find um, 2000 AD. It, it gets kicked quite a bit social on social media and in forums and whatnot. And um, I, I'm not sure if it's justified because I think there's such. It, it's like a losing battle. You, you try to do groundbreaking stuff, but you have got to do it within a, a certain amount. You can't. You can't. It can't be so you know, offensive to some people because it'll just get taken off the shelf. So they, 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 tread, they have to tread such a fine line. And um, mm. if they... If, I, I don't like using the term, but it is council culture. And if it was to cross that line, it could quite easily just... Uh, you know, rebellion could just say, oh, it's just, it's just not worth our while. And, um, you know, take it off the shelves. Not that I think... I don't think they would. But... Um, you know, in, I just think in the seventies and eighties, it was there to kick people in the teeth, wasn't it? Two thousand AD, it was meant to be that kind of thing. Whereas I don't think it can probably get away with doing that quite as much nowadays. I guess it, it's about who it speaks to. So for me personally, the strip that spoke to me is one of the least remembered ones. Um, Pete Milligan, Brendan McCarthy um, did um, sooner or later. And the first okay. book of that <laughs> is basically my story of unemployment in the early 80s mm -hmm. as a teenager, struggling well to get work and find any meaning at all. And there's this conversation, these three bubbles on this on this panel. And this is I'm going to leave it with this, right, because I have to go in a minute. Mm. So there's two punks. They're talking to each other. One goes, yeah. The other one goes, what? The th that first one goes, nothing. And that was all the conversation was. Yeah, what? <laughs> Nothing. And for me, I went, I know those guys. <laughs> in fact, they come back and score some draw off them. <laughs> anyway, guys, I'm going to have to go. Really? So I'm going to have to take well, well, right, I do apologise. Yeah. But... Yeah. All right. So, yeah, I've got to so go because yeah. I'm. Um, I've got to get. A... <laughs> got to go to the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Steve, better okay, bigger than that. Right. We're, 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 yeah. we're, we're, we're the pain of being on a on a beer in the comics podcast. This is the beer of tomorrow, guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah I'll... so good. Screenshot of that. Oh, Cheers, guys. Down. See you, Jeff. See you, Tony. See, see, see you, Jeff. Thanks so much. Bye bye. Cheers. Guys. Cheers. Thank you so much. <laughs> Everyone needed a toilet at the exact same time. There. I, that was I, incredible. I, I have to see. I'm. I'm I'm perched on the edge of my seat. <laughs> <laughs> I actually just hit my screen and disappeared. So I, I'm, I'm fresh. <laughs> right. you, you didn't okay. mute your mic. I could hear you. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine this. Okay. Um, cheers, Colin. Thank you so much to Steve, Nensky, and, and Dan for joining us there. Um, I will share everything that they've done in, in our comments so that if anybody wants to check them out, that would be absolutely amazing. Thank you so much for this week, Colin. Yeah, and absolutely. Everybody going back Blazer on Kickstarter. because Absolutely. Pretty much everybody here has been involved in it in some way. Um, hold on. There we go. I can tell you, I can see your face. You're so desperate for the... There we go. Kickstarter projects, the 77 comic slash Blazer. Please check it out. Absolutely amazing. Cheers, Colin. Cheers, Dave.